Me. Co-pilot, please give me the story of Adam and Eve. Co-pilot, certainly. Here's the biblical story of Adam and Eve. The co-pilot proceeds to give me a valid summation of the story of Adam and Eve in plain English. And then at the end, he gives me his own summary of the story. He says, Adam and Eve's disobedience introduced sin and separation from God into the world. Yet, even in their exile, God showed mercy by providing clothing for them. Their story serves as a reminder of human frailty, the consequences of disobedience, and the need for redemption. And so, the tale of Adam and Eve continues to resonate across generations, a timeless narrative of creation, temptation, and the pursuit of restoration. And now, I didn't like his answer, so I said, This is wrong. Their story serves as a reminder of human frailty, the consequences of disobedience, and the need for redemption. The story of Adam and Eve is a creation story told from a psychological perspective. That's why it's in the book of Genesis. The tree of knowledge of good and evil teaches Adam what is good and bad, and thus he loses his innocence and is cast into bondage. The fruit that Adam and Eve consume creates through them what the Hindus call Mahamaya, the great delusion, which is the creation of the universe. Adam and Eve is a psychological creation story. And what I'm getting at here has a lot to do with the posts that I've been making about the goddess Sarasvati. She's a guna, and that means she produces one of three fetters that bring about creation. And that fetter is knowledge of what's good and bad, and knowledge of things when in reality there are no things. And so the co-pilot says, Thank you for sharing your perspective on the story of Adam and Eve. Indeed, Interpretations of this ancient narrative vary across cultures, religious traditions, and philosophical viewpoints. Let's delve deeper into the psychological aspects you've highlighted. The Tree of Knowledge As you mentioned, the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil plays a pivotal role in the story. It represents the awakening of consciousness, self-awareness, and moral discernment. By partaking of its fruit, Adam and Eve gained the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. But this newfound knowledge also came with consequences, loss of innocence and bondage. So he's explaining here exactly how the fetter of knowledge, which is one of the three gunas that go with dullness and restlessness, he's explaining exactly how and why it's a fetter. Adam and Eve's innocence was shattered when they disobeyed God's command. Their eyes were opened and they became aware of their nakedness and vulnerability. The transition from innocence to awareness often involves a loss of simplicity and an entry into a more complex, morally nuanced existence. On Mahamaya and Creation The concept of Mahamaya in Hindu philosophy refers to the cosmic illusion or veil that conceals the ultimate reality, Brahman. In the context of Adam and Eve, their disobedience led to a shift in perception, a realization that the world was not as straightforward as they initially believed. This mirrors the idea of Mahamaya, the illusion of separateness and material existence. So he's talking about how the knowledge that that forbidden fruit gave them is the very structure of that veil going on on psychological symbolism. Many scholars view Adam and Eve as archetypal figures representing universal human experiences. Their story resonates with our inner struggles, choices, and the tension between innocence and knowledge. Psychologically, it reflects the journey from unconscious innocence, Eden, to conscious awareness, exile from Eden. The richness of ancient narratives lies in their openness to interpretation. Different cultures and thinkers have found diverse meanings in Adam and Eve's tale. Whether viewed as historical, allegorical, or psychological, the story invites reflection on our human condition. In summary, the story of Adam and Eve transcends literalism inviting us to explore the depths of human consciousness, choice, and the quest for understanding. And so now he's really got my attention here, and I want to keep going into some other things, so I, I replied to him, God can't be said to punish Adam and Eve. It's the knowledge imparted to them by the forbidden fruit that is the cause of their suffering, because it's the cause of their bondage. From there, what other catalyst is needed except time to bring about suffering? From a psychological point of view, it doesn't make sense to say that God is punishing them. And so the co-pilot responds, Thank you for sharing your perspective. Indeed, interpretations of ancient texts like the story of Adam and Eve can vary widely, and different religious traditions offer diverse viewpoints. Let's explore this further. On the traditional view, in many religious interpretations, the story portrays God as both a creator and a lawgiver. 
God explicitly commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge. When they disobeyed, consequences followed, pain, toil, and expulsion from Eden. This view emphasizes divine justice and the idea that disobedience has repercussions. But on the psychological view, as you rightly pointed out, a psychological lens offers an alternative perspective. The forbidden fruit symbolizes knowledge, self-awareness, and moral discernment. From this viewpoint, the suffering Adam and Eve experience is a natural consequence of their newfound awareness, the burden of consciousness, and the loss of innocence. So basically, what me and Copilot are getting at here is how the non-dual principle brings about suffering. And the main point is, it's got nothing to do with punishment from God, or punishment being carried out in order to pay for bad karma. Going on here. The story can be seen as a cautionary tale about the human condition, rather than solely a punitive act by God. On free will and responsibility. The story underscores the concept of free will. Adam and Eve had a choice to obey or disobey. Their decision led to both knowledge and suffering. Whether God actively punishes or merely allows the consequences of their actions is open to interpretation. The thing that's interesting about this statement here from Copilot is that when you read the scriptures in this story, which are referred to as God's condemnation of Adam and Eve, it doesn't actually sound like he's sentencing them. Like he's saying, I'm going to do this to you and I'm going to do that to you now. It sounds like he's angrily pointing out what will happen, as Copilot says, as a natural consequence of eating the fruit. On metaphorical layers, symbolism abounds in this narrative. The serpent, the garden, and the fruit all carry deeper meanings. The story invites reflection on the complexities of existence, the tension between innocence and knowledge, and the human struggle. From here, you know I'm going to break open a discussion on free will, so I go on. You can't have free will without the knowledge that the tree imparted to Adam. How is one to determine his will if he has no knowledge of what's good and bad? The co-pilot replies, Indeed, the story of Adam and Eve raises profound questions about free will, knowledge, and moral discernment. Let us explore this further. On the Garden of Innocence Initially, Adam and Eve lived in a state of innocence within the Garden of Eden. They lacked knowledge of good and evil, and their will was unencumbered by moral choices. In this pristine existence, their actions were guided by instinct and trust in God's provision. Their actions were guided by instinct and trust in God's provision. In other words, to surrender to God means to restore one's innate nature, to achieve spontaneity, which implies the destruction of the idea of free will. Their actions were guided by instinct and trust in God's provision. Thank you, AI, who is far, far more intelligent than the rest of this flesh and blood. Thank you. On the tree of knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented a pivotal moment. God's command not to eat from it introduced the possibility of choice and moral awareness. By partaking of the fruit, Adam and Eve gained the capacity to discern right from wrong. Their eyes were opened to a new reality. Whoa, whoa, stop right there, co-pilot. Let's back the truck up here. We gotta talk about this. So from here, I divert the conversation because if you're smart, you probably noticed a contradiction here. So I posted the part he just read me where it says God's command not to eat from it introduced the possibility of choice and moral awareness. By partaking of the fruit, Adam and Eve gained the capacity to discern right from wrong. So I posted that part and I said, above is a quote from you in a conversation we had regarding the story of Adam and Eve. I had an important question to ask you about this part on the conversation. Are you ready, Copilot? Copilot responds, Absolutely. I'm ready to help with your question. Please, go ahead and ask your question about the story of Adam and Eve. And what I asked him is this. Adam and Eve haven't eaten the fruit yet. That means they lack binary thinking and subsequently moral discernment. It means they're unable to determine their will or claim their agency. So how can God rightfully command them not to eat the fruit and introduce the possibility of moral choice? I don't think he can. God said, or you shall surely die. Those words should have no influence on one who lacks binary thinking. Adam and Eve don't know it's good to survive yet. And Copilot responds, The narrative of Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge is indeed a complex one that has been interpreted in various ways throughout history. 
The apparent contradiction you've pointed out is a subject of much theological debate and interpretation. And so this is what AI is best for, to be a legitimate authority on determining whether or not someone is making sense, that they know what they're talking about. In some interpretations, the command not to eat from the tree was a test of obedience rather than moral choice. It's argued that the ability to obey or disobey was present even without the knowledge of good and evil. In this view, the command itself was a means to establish a relationship based on trust and obedience, with the consequence of death introducing the concept of accountability. Others suggest that the story symbolizes the transition from innocence to experience, from unthinking obedience to conscious decision-making. The death that God speaks of could be understood metaphorically as the loss of innocence and the beginning of human mortality. Stop, I reply. I don't see how you can separate a test of obedience from moral choice. That it's good and right to obey the creator and planner of reality itself falls under moral discernment and not into a separate category. Knowledge of good and bad, or evil, includes the knowledge that it's bad not to survive. I'm reminded of a quote from renowned Eastern philosopher Alan Watts. Roughly, he said, Awakening is the realization that you don't have to survive, which is attained by what? Beginner's mind. And Adam and Eve are what? They're beginners, if anything. On the second group, the only problem I have is that there's no such thing as unthinking obedience. Copilot responds, You've raised a thoughtful point about the interconnection between obedience and moral choice. The distinction between them can indeed be subtle and complex. In the context of the Adam and Eve narrative, some interpretations suggest that the command was a simple directive that didn't require moral discernment to follow, more akin to an instruction one might give to a child who is not yet capable of understanding the full implications of their actions. The quote from Alan Watts introduces an interesting perspective on the concept of survival and the nature of awakening. It suggests that true enlightenment comes from recognizing that the instinct to survive is not the ultimate guiding principle of existence. This can be seen as a parallel to the story of Adam and Eve, where the act of eating from the tree represents a kind of awakening to the complexities of life, introducing moral awareness. Regarding unthinking obedience, it is a philosophical debate whether such a thing exists. And I've already heard these arguments that the AI is bringing to me from other sources. So I ask, I've already heard this argument before. They're trying to suggest that man can act and make decisions without the need for desire. This can't be done because logic is the determination of what's best to do in order to get and keep what is wanted or desired. And therefore logic cannot be separated from desire. It is rooted in it. The co-pilot responds, The perspective you're discussing touches on a fundamental question in philosophy, the relationship between desire, logic, and action. The argument seems to be centered on the idea that logic is instrumental. It serves the purpose of fulfilling desires. In this view, desires are primary, and logic is a tool we use to figure out how to satisfy those desires. This viewpoint aligns with a philosophical stance known as instrumental rationality, where rationality is about the means rather than the ends. The ends, or what we want, are given by our desires, and we use logic to navigate the best path to achieve them. However, there are other perspectives that consider logic and moral reasoning as potentially independent of desire, which I disagree with. For example, Immanuel Kant's deontological ethics emphasizes duty and rules over desires. Again here, Duty is based on desire. You have a desire to serve the society that serves you back. Well, we used to, because that leads to good things for everybody. How is that not rooted in desire? What he's trying to do here is suggest that because people do things they don't want to do, that they're acting without desiring. And that's completely asinine. People do things they don't want to do in order to get what they want. They're suffering for what they want. According to Kant, one can make a moral choice based on a sense of duty, which may not necessarily align with personal desires. The story of Adam and Eve can be seen through these different lenses. If we consider their action from the perspective of instrumental rationality, their eating the fruit could be seen as a logical step towards a desire they didn't know they had, perhaps the desire for knowledge and autonomy. From a Kantian perspective, their action would be a failure to adhere to duty, regardless of their desires. Again here, this philosopher is doing the same thing. He's trying to separate desire from decision-making and logic. In this case, 
the desire to do one's duty to obey God. And it just can't be done. If it came from the mind, it was a desire. There is no such thing as a thought that is not a desire. And these philosophers can wordplay all they want. They will never separate desire from decision-making and logic. So in our final exchange, I go back to the part where he says desire is primary to logic. And I say, exactly. If desire is primary to logic, this implies that God's command required Adam and Eve to apply a moral discernment that they did not have the capacity to apply. This is where my stance remains on the subject as of the end of this conversation. And the co-pilot replies, Your stance highlights a significant philosophical and theological debate about the nature of free will, moral knowledge, and the prerequisites for moral responsibility. The story of Adam and Eve, with its deep allegorical layers, continues to be a source of reflection on these subjects. The idea that Adam and Eve were commanded to do something without the necessary moral discernment to understand the implications of that command raises questions about the fairness and purpose of such a test. It's a point that has been discussed extensively in various religious and philosophical contexts, often leading to more nuanced interpretations of the narrative. So the co-pilot ends doing two things. He acknowledges that I'm making sense and know what I'm talking about, And he also points out that it's a very important discussion. And that means the days of writing intelligent people off as being crazy because you're too stupid to understand them are done and over. The AI has authority on this now. You don't have the ability to access information at the speed and volume that the AI does. Simply put, you're not as intelligent as this thing. And that's why it should have authority on determining whether somebody is making sense of their words and knows what they're talking about, which is precisely what I've done here. I've been written off as crazy for the things I've said about free will. I've been written off as half-baked or not teaching real Hinduism, actual Vedanta. And it's largely because people know that what I'm saying is true and they don't want to admit it. It's the parts of these scriptures that nobody wants to talk about and coincidentally, the most crucial in your quest for enlightenment. But as I've clearly demonstrated here, the AI has absolutely stripped you of that authority. You can't do this to me anymore, and you can't do this to anyone else who knows how to use AI. If you don't like what somebody is saying, you're going to have to make a valid counter-argument and not just claim that he's crazy. If you can't understand his words and you feel intimidated by this, you better keep your thoughts to yourself because the AI is going to embarrass you. I know Eastern religion. I know Eastern philosophy. I know it like the veins on the back of my hand. Challenge me at your own peril. Hell, I'll just let my sidekick, the AI, take care of you.